learn to improve conversions and generate more leads with the video podcast at marketingoptimization.tv. Hi, and welcome to Marketing Optimization with Alex Designs. I'm your host, Alex Harris, and today we're ta- chatting with Xavier from Conversion Garden. How are you doing, Xavier? Hi, Alex. Very well. Thank you. To get started, what would be your definition of optimization and why is it beneficial? My definition of optimization, that's a very good question. My definition of optimization is increasing revenue for my clients. Mm-hmm. Growing in revenue, that's the, that's, in, that's the thing, impacting in the bottom line. Obviously, increasing the conversion rate, the percentage of uh, users who are buying from you, if that's your, your main goal, mm-hmm. that impacts the bottom line. But not only. There are many other ways, obviously, increasing the average order value, in, increasing the size of the basket. Um, everything that helps you to, to make most of your online or digital presence, that's what I will understand as, as optimization. Mm. Yeah, that continuous improvement, you know, to the, uh, to generate more revenue specifically will keep yeah. you in business. That's for sure. Yeah, but everything that I do is focused on revenue. So I'm uh, uh, most of the optimization I do is for e-commerce sites or at some point transactional sites like mm-hmm. travel sites, mm-hmm. uh, hotel booking, and, uh, and this kind of, of sites. And my metric of success is not it's not conversion rate. Mm-hmm. Conversion rate can remain the same, but increase of revenue mm, yeah absolutely that that's a, that's a good point increasing conversion does not necessarily mean more revenue and we'll get yeah. a little, little bit into that so uh, you're based in London to get started let's tell people maybe a little bit about you what you specialize in and we'll go from there sure so uh, actually my I'm, uh, I've been working for the last six years as web analyst mm-hmm and that's how I jump. I used to be a developer back in the day in the dot com bubble, uh, HTML, PHP, CSS, all this kind of stuff. And I jumped to the marketing side of the internet with uh, Google Analytics and Web Analytics. Then I became a, an analyst. At, at some point in my career, three, four years ago, I discovered conversion rate optimization, and for me, it just made sense to keep my trajectory as analyst and to grow into a more actionable uh, profile, not only reporting what's wrong, but actually going testing mm-hmm. and, and improving things. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's it's a, the how the web has changed. Um, you know, I used to be basically a web designer who did conversion as an incentive. Now I'm a conversion rate optimization consultant who does web design just to make things actually happen. <laughs> so the, the web has certainly changed and you, you need to adapt your career to that. We, we were speaking earlier that one of your specialties is understanding the voice of the customer. And it's probably a term that's used a lot in our space. Can you give us like your perception of that VOC? Sure, and I'll and I'll put it in context with uh, with the traditional analytics uh, understood as the clickstream analytics that we use. Mm-hmm. That will tell us the what, what's going on in our website, how many traffic uh, we have, what these people doing in our website, mm-hmm. what are they doing, what are the outcomes. That's what we have in our analytics package, as Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics. Uh, voice of customers is a is a way. Uh, that we have to to say or to refer to why things happen. Mm-hmm. So why people is bouncing off my landing page, why people is dropping on the shopping cart, why people is not fulfilling the checkout. All the techniques and the tools and and secrets that we use to to get this why. That's yeah. what we call the voice of customer analysis. Some people call it qualitative analysis. But yeah, that's summarized as VOC. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, you know, there's many ways to, to gather that qualitative insight. I call it gathering intelligence. You're you're, you're coming up uh, with all the scenarios possible. What's going on in the customer's mind? So, are there any particular tools that you use to gather that data? Yes, there are many, many tools and and many and many techniques. Um, let me start quickly with different techniques. Mm-hmm. Uh, a very simple technique that uh, researchers have been using for years is observation. And yeah, analytics is somehow an observation, but just um, these amazing tools that we have nowadays for session recording, 
there's a brand new call Hotjar, but we have obviously Clicktail, Decibel Insights, Inspeglet, many tools to to see how users are interacting with our websites. Mm -hmm. That's super useful, and that's voice of customer as well because it's observating why mm -hmm. why they or what they do, and we figure out what problems they have. Uh, that's one technique. Uh, obviously, asking is the most powerful one and mm -hmm. the most famous one. And there's, again, a number of ways and a number of tools to ask our visitors and our users um, questions. We have for Q, uh, for Q, Qualaru, we can do a short uh, question that uh, pops up in your website. We can do a long survey in the website. We can just send some questions via email. I mean, mm -hmm. there's lots of techniques. The secret is, is always to find the right technique for the question that you have. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You can't copy what other people are doing just because the latest blog post says to use particularly these tools. They may not necessarily work for you in your own way. Uh, I actually just interviewed uh, the founder of Hotjar, um, and uh, they, they were just previously on, on the show. And I, I like how they're bringing all the tools into one dashboard, the ability to collect um, user feedback and do polls and then also do that uh, mouse tracking, uh, watching the people's mouse movements and what they do, and that heat map, click map tracking as well. Uh, is that, that that type of thing you're doing with trying to figure out that voice of the customer? Yes, and I have to say that I'm in love with Hotjar so far, and it's only in beta, because mm -hmm. I had to use several tools to achieve the same, and now I have it in one place. The, as, as, as designer, I, uh, uh, I wonder what's your opinion about Hotjar's design, but I think it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can, some, some tools um, uh, are good uh, in a functional point of view, but they are not beautiful and you don't want to have them in your website because the survey that, that shows up, it's, it's not beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, but Hotjar is, and, and yeah, it's a tool that will simplify the, the researcher and the qualitative analyst uh, lives much more. Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting, you know, how Hotjar has become so popular um, in just the last year. They have 20,000 people using their service on, on different sites. And, and I, what I wanted to point out is how Hotjar collected their own feedback along the way to iterate their own product. So I think it, it, it shows you that just because there's a tool out there, if it's just out there, you buy it, you never use it, you're never going to get those results. You need to collect that data and have a very fast iterative feedback loop, collecting the data, understanding your customers really well, fine tuning your personas, and then putting that into actionable advice where you create a hypothesis and actually test. Is there a process or framework that you go through for your testing in that way, collecting that qualitative and quantitative data and then actually creating a hypothesis? Absolutely. Uh, and I have to say that my method is, is not new at all. It's at least 2,000 years old because it's the scientific method. Yeah. So it all starts with, and this is very important, sometimes we we miss that stage, which is identifying a problem. Mm. And very often we want to optimize something without knowing what the problem is in first place. You know, mm. So we have a new client as conversion rate optimization specialist and, and we land to the very first page and we start giving recommendations. Okay, <laughs> just take notes, but hold on because we need to find where the problems are. Yeah. That's, that's very important. So that's the first step. Identify the problems. That's what, that why you really need a, a, a very good analytic setup, clear goals, clear funnels. Mm -hmm. So identifying problems is easy. Then research. Once you identify the problems, you want to know as much as possible about the, about the problem as you can. That's where use of, uh, of voice of customer tools, session recording, heat maps, all that. It's super, super useful. Once you narrow down the problem, then you want to research it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the use of voice of customer is uh, back and forth with uh, the Google Analytics or the web analytics tool that you are using. Mm -hmm. I identify this this uh, problem. I have this insight from customers. Does it make sense? Because we need to validate the voice of customer and we have to analyze it as well. We don't have to 
uh, take it just because we have a comment. We have we don't have to stop machines and, and change everything. Mm -hmm. And once we identify the problem, once we research it, the critical point establishing the hypothesis. And I always work with hypotheses. Mm -hmm. I've not always been working with hypotheses. I have to say, I have a past where I will make my hypothesis after the test results, which was always easy. But I still see so many people doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, doing that, uh, they they take the conclusions after the test results. So, what we learned from the test? Well, the hypothesis should be set up up front. Otherwise, it's not a true validated learning. Mm -hmm. Hypothesis, test, experimentation and conclusion so that's the scientific method again nothing new but it just works so well yeah well yeah it's a uh, the scientific method is is the key is that you are there is some observation that you can create a hypothesis from to identify that problem and then be able to validate it through split testing uh, you know running those experiments and then figuring out what's working and then do more of that being able to scale and grow based on what's winning and what's not a uh, great explanation of, of, of your framework now i i want to get a little bit deeper you know once you know you know what's working and you've tested a bunch of times eventually you're going to reach you know a local maximum you're going to you're going to mm -hmm. start to see diminishing returns from your test uh is there a point that you that you establish that you have to break through that plateau to get to better results. I, kn I know a lot of it has to do with the voice of the customer. You dig in deeper into the language, the unique value propositions. Is there any advice for, you know, kind of the, the advanced person who's, who's looking for <laughs> things to test, but they just, they're getting very small, if, if even meaningful results? Actually, that's that's great question, and that's uh, when voice of customer is just perfect for us mm -hmm. because obviously there's many ways where there are many ways that we can use the voice of customer. We can ask, ask specific questions uh, like this uh, very popular question, which is the visitor intent: What did you come to achieve today, or what was the purpose of your visit? Mm -hmm. Purchase, uh, browse, shop, etc. Uh, and that's okay to get exactly, as you said, this, this local maximum. But open fields and other techniques, not necessarily sur surveys like personas and observation and just interviewing users, mm -hmm. will get us what Donald Rumsfeld used to call in a famous speech, the unknown unknowns. Those things that we don't know, that we don't know. Mm. And they are just spontaneous from your users. So we are not aiming to get that piece of insight, but just by going out of the building, mm. uh, someone will tell us, okay, you know, that's what I want, and you are not solving that problem. Mm. Because we can only analyze and we can only identify and track and measure what we have. But if there's something important that we, or something crucial for a user that we should be doing in, in our website that we are not, we cannot measure what doesn't exist, right? Yeah. So we need to get out of the building and ask open questions. Yeah. I think that's actually a, a really great point. You know, we as consultants or, you know, web marketers in our in our companies, we get a uh, that silo, that funnel effect, you know, and we're looking at it so much that it's very hard to see what else opportunity there is. So, you know, um, get, getting outside of your office, getting other people uh, other people's insight about your tests, having a completely different perspective from your target market, or maybe even completely opposite, and people who would never buy your stuff in the first place, it will help you think differently because you are uh, you are looking at this, and we we tend to have that that funnel blindness after working on the same project for so long. And I see that all the time in in my clients, startups, corporations, mm. middle companies. I see that all the time. The team is so focused in in some uh, pre-established hypothesis that they have that they only want to measure, have insights regarding those uh, those few hypotheses, mm -hmm. and that's final citing them. You know. Uh, uh, the moment they they you, or you manage as consultant to break that uh, silo and, and get them to understand that there are so many more variables uh, affecting the conversion than the ones that they think they always think it's price and competitors. Mm, That's yeah. it. Yeah, it's always no, it's all competitors. And and the moment you bring the voice of customer, which is somehow bringing the user into the decision making, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they realize that, well, there's many more things that we should be doing and we are so focused mm -hmm. in these two things that uh, we are not seeing the opportunity up there. Yeah, and it, there's many probably different ways that you can do this. You don't have to you know, hire a, a focus lab where you bring people in. That could be the extreme if you can afford that. But you can simply just listen to your customer service calls, have them recorded. If you haven't done that, definitely recommend doing that. Uh, look at your OLARC or live chat results. There's many um, a lot of information in there that you probably haven't seen where you can find opportunity. If uh, whatever your clients have books or your competitors have books, look at their book reviews and see what people didn't expect to get from them. You know, if you're a consultant, you know, I was I'm working on my book right now. I, I went in and saw what other people didn't like from, you know, potentially similar books. There's there's many different ways that you can get the customer's insight, you know, get them on Skype, you know, uh, talk to them over Twitter. Um, do you have any other ways to, you know, talk to the people maybe on, you know, kind of a budget, not the kind of the focus group focus? Yes, I do a lot of guerrilla testing yeah. uh, here in London, but also in Barcelona, uh, in Spain. Uh, just work, and actually, I used to do it with a laptop. Uh, I always recommend it to. I, I always recommend to to have two people to do a guerrilla testing because it's not uh, as aggressive for the user than mm -hmm. just approaching you by yourself. But two people, any Starbucks in the world. You walk in with a laptop, a tablet, even a mobile phone with your app or the mobile version of your website. Mm. If you see someone uh, alone having a, a, a latte or even if it's two people, there's also a lot of value in having two people. Actually, in my last guerrilla test uh, a couple of, of months ago, uh, I, something uh, very amazing happened to me. Uh, it was two, guy, two, two guys in the Starbucks, and one was in front of the other. And, 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 and the subject with the laptop was explaining the website to the other. So we got the audio, uh, the, the experience of the, one of the folks using the website, mm -hmm. but also the qualitative uh, insight of how he perceived and he, how, how he communicated uh, the website to, to the other folk. And just by going to Starbucks, at the end of the session, obviously, it takes 10, 15 minutes. It's not, it's guerrilla, so it's not something that you want to take someone like half an hour. It works so, so well. Every time I do it, you learn so much and, and you don't need uh, a large budget, you know, only paying some lattes to some good people. and. People is wonderful. They they will always ask, uh, help you. You ask uh, people in the street, can you take a look at my mobile app? Uh, it's only going to take five minutes. Yeah. And I've done this many, many times and I never had a problem. Most of the people is friendly and they give you such an amazing insight. Now I'm going to have to uh, work up some confidence to go to Whole Foods and ask a, a bunch of people to review <laughs> some of my health focus sites. That, that could be interesting. Yeah, try it, even if it's only for your own uh, website or a project that you are working on. Mm -hmm. The first time it's like, what I'm doing, you know, I'm stopping strangers in the street or in a Whole Foods. But you'll see that the reaction is, is great. And it's a technique that uh, I have a friend who works in a large corporation. He didn't have the budget for, for usability testing. And he gave me a call and I'm doing it anyway. Can you help me? And I was, yeah, I mean, and oh, he yeah. went, he went by himself, obviously telling no one, showing the website to, to, to people in a Starbucks. And he came back to his boss and showed a proper usability uh, analysis with some amazing insights. Mm -hmm. and, and it cost him maybe 10 pounds. Yeah. Now, that's actually a, a great real world example that certainly anybody could try. Of course, if you have the, the confidence or a great friend like you to, to come along <laughs> for sure. Um, so let's talk like after you would gather that information, you, you now have a bunch of information and you, you created specific patterns on the people who would buy or maybe not buy. Is, is there an approach that you tie that in together with like actionable web analytics or, um, you know, creating hypothesis or you, you, it's maybe uh, it comes down to your persona modeling and I'm confusing all everything all together in one big question to really <laughs> confuse you. But I think you get the idea. 
Yeah, I, I get the idea. Uh, I think there are three levels of insights. Uh, there's one level of insights uh, that you they don't need analysis. Uh, I'll put a simple example. If I'm tonight uh, sleeping here in my place and one uh, neighbor comes to me calling fire, fire, get out of the building, there's, there's fire. I'm not going to question his representativeness. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask, okay, who is this the majority, the, the, the main opinion of the other neighbors? I just go out of the building and see by myself if there's a fire. And this happens a lot. So we have some, some feedback from users like, I wasn't able to purchase or I had this severe problem that we don't need two people to confirm that just if it's if it's happening to someone it's just because it happened once is uh, is severe enough to to mm -hmm. tackle and yeah. and we will find feedbacks like this then there's a middle ground of insights that i perception uh, how people is feeling about their website that they need some validation because obviously each of us has an opinion and, and when you ask for feedback and you do surveys people will give you feedback but that feedback needs to be validated uh, with your with your uh, web analytics package so if people is complaining about the checkout page but the drop off is only 20% Okay, maybe the perception, and we should be wondering why the perception of the user is, is that it's not a good checkout, but we know for a fact that they are completing it, so that's no problem. And in the third level, I will, I will put definitely personas. Uh, when we talk about personas, obviously, you know, we are talking about mental models, and that's something that can be done with surveys, can be done with your web analytics package. It, ne it needs interviews. Mm -hmm simple but it's complex to get good interviews and yeah. to have someone good at making interviews actually and the level and the quality of insight that you have from interviews mapping those into variables mm -hmm. finding the patterns and building the personas based on on those interviews is is unique and it doesn't only affect the the website, it has impact uh, in the product, in the marketing, yeah. in pretty much every area of the of the business. Yeah, it's a, it's a very similar description of uh, Brian Eisenberg's new book, Buyer Legends. And it's a, you know, a basically a long hypothesis and writing out a specific narrative to each persona and their story and how they actually, you know, convert their customer journey, but also the, the emotional triggers that happens to them of the reasons of why they could be potentially trying to shop for your products. You know, what are those emotional triggers that happen in their life before they go to Google and type in a specific search query? And, you know, what's kind of going on in life? Do they have kids? Do they not? Are they making enough money? Are they not? And then tying all that empathy into making their lives better through your marketing. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a big fan of everything that comes from Brian, but uh, Bayer Legend was just awesome because he he has this gift to combine uh, the latest of the digital marketing industry, but also the good all time storytelling and the techniques that have worked for in, in marketing for decades. And I really miss more people in the industry. And this is a complaint that I often do. I think that the digital marketing industry has built has been built by people like you, designer or like me, developer, and we have uh, scientists and stuff. But we don't have true marketers, marketeers. Mm -hmm. I think that the the people from traditional strategic marketing didn't jump in the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's why people like Brian Eisenberg and, and, and his brother and Jeffrey, they are so available because they bring decades of insights of succeeding um, or successful techniques that combine with the digital era. Uh, we get the most of it. And I just want to, I, I would love to see more marketeers, more people with 30, 40 years of experience in marketing uh, talking to us. Yeah, no, it's a good point. There's certainly a, a, a significant generation difference on how stories were told, uh, you know, 
uh, Brian's not a lot older than me, but he definitely is older uh, than than us. So you can definitely see the difference, you know, the way uh, Seth Godin markets versus, you know, uh, Jeff Walker. Uh, you know, it's, it's there's obviously a, a big generation difference between the, the, the old school marketing, traditional marketing, and today's, you know, conversion or growth hacking community. Yeah, uh, I think that in in here in in, in Europe, the, the we mostly use the words digital marketing, and I think that we do a lot of digital. I miss the marketing. Uh, I think we are great in the techniques and in the tools, mm -hmm. but um, I think we really can improve in marketing. And some people they think, okay, it's pre, it's pre, it's from before the the digital marketing era and they discard it and I think that there are amazing learnings to 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 be gathered from from the traditional marketing yeah and any uh, just putting it out there any ways that people could you know adapt that old school thinking any particular books or blogs that you follow that are focused on that traditional sense Actually, there's an amazing book which I will label as a treasure uh, from this guy uh, Eugene Schwartz. Mm. Uh, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. Sorry, Eugene Schwartz was a he was a copywriter, and and that's interesting story because he used to do A/B testing in the 60s mm -hmm. with uh, mailing lists. Again, we think we invented uh, A/B testing, and he used to deliver one uh, piece of publicity with a headline mm -hmm. and a telephone number to list A, these postal codes. He will do another headline for the same ad, deliver it to another uh, postal code list, and he will count calls. And that's how he tested for years. And his book is Breakthrough Advertising. He talks there about the theory about market sophistication, that it's something that some people is talking out there about it. And market sophistication is, is a theory that it's, again, it's 40, maybe 50 years old. And it's so, so, so actual for startups from today mm -hmm. that it's amazing that it's a 50 years old book. Very cool. I'm, I'm certainly going to check that out. You know, I, I didn't go to marketing school. I didn't go to business school. I've learned everything basically on yeah. the fly. And, and I'm learning more from you today <laughs> on, on the podcast for sure. So that's that's why uh, we, we created the show and we love bringing uh, great guests on the show. So let's tell people about, about you. How can they find out more? What are you doing? Well, yeah, I'm in Twitter all the time. And uh, now as freelancer, I, <laughs> I just every day in Twitter and they can find me there. Uh, I have a website which is not great, uh, but it's going to be renewed soon, which is conversiongarden.com. Mm -hmm. And they can find me in London in pretty much every uh, analytics and conversion optimization event. We have lots of meetups and here the London community, we know all each other. Uh, events like Measure Cam, definitely you'll see me there. Uh, and yeah, I, um, I'm over here always uh, happy to have a pint with someone visiting. Excellent. I can't wait to have a pint with you. What would be one thing that optimizers can do to take their conversion rates and their business to that next level? Well, after talk, uh, after having talked so much about voice of customer, I'll go for the easy one, which is listening. Mm -hmm. Listening, uh, listen to your users. Uh, sometimes when we are analyzing or optimizing landing pages or websites, we are not the real target of the uh, website. So maybe we are super experts in our area, but we are analyzing or judging a landing page, yeah. which is not for us. Yeah. And we are going to get it wrong. And again, observation, asking, interviewing, going to a Starbucks. There are so many ways that we can uh, listen to people that just go and get out of the building, as the Lean Startup says, and listen to your customer. Yeah, great, great job. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for watching the Marketing Optimization Podcast with Alex Designs. Please remember to subscribe to all of the videos in my YouTube channel. Thank you.